<laughs> Hi, I'm, I'm Phil Carpenter, and I'm currently uh, what's called the Prime Minister of the Fungus Federation of Santa Cruz. And I have, have been for, for a number of years. Uh, so, uh, interesting story how, how that came to be. Uh, the Fungus Federation of Santa Cruz was actually uh, started by David Aurora. You know, he lived in Santa Cruz when he wrote the book. Uh, he was probably in his early 20s when he first did this. There was no internet. There was, th that book was typed. It wasn't done on a word processor. So just to see where we've been. Anyway, uh, he started the Fungus Federation of Santa Cruz. And he, he, if you're familiar with that book, he's got an amazing wit. And so rather than calling ourselves officers, we're called ministers. <laughs> So, but the president was always called the CEO. But I was giving an interview once to a, a I think it was a, a reporter from the Herald, who said, why aren't you the prime minister? The rest, the rest of your group are ministers. If you're the president, why wouldn't you be the prime minister? I said, I like it. <laughs> I'm going with it. So that, that's... And that's a 20-foot morel. Oh, wow. Actually not. <laughs> that, that is a morel. It just looks like it's 20 feet tall. So, it's, uh, this, this is uh, in the Sierras. Uh, we don't get morels uh, down here much, although in landscaped areas you can get morels growing. But in the Sierras you get natural ones, which this is, and then you get what we call uh, burn morels. The black morels. I have some pictures of those a little bit later. So you can what is the actual size of that? It's probably only about an inch and a half tall. <laughs> oh, gotcha. Yeah, one. All right. So uh, here's what we're going to do. If you hit that again, please. We're going to look for the key parts of a mushroom. What you need to study and the best way to learn how to uh, learn how to identify mushrooms. Because I assume most people's interest on mushrooms is eating them. And if you're going to eat them, you have to know how to identify them. Or know someone who can identify them for you, and you trust them with your life. So, uh, okay. Uh, different parts of a mushroom. The annulus, or the veil. This, this is the mycological term. This is called the pileus, or the lamellae. Uh, and this is called a vulva. And that is important in certain types of mushrooms, mainly the genus Amanita. And the genus Amanita is probably the most important genus to know because it contains the deadly ones, the ones that will kill them. So to be able to recognize that genus is really important. Okay, now here's an example of something that does not have gills. Not all mushrooms have gills. This is actually a poured mushroom. The, the spores of the mushrooms are produced in tubes the, uh, on the underside of the mushroom instead of on the gill faces of a, of a gilled mushroom. So, go ahead. Okay, so to get started, you're going to need some kind of a minimal amount of equipment. You're going to need something to collect mushrooms into. We recommend a wicker basket, mainly because wicker, first of all, will hold up in rain. A uh, paper sack will work, but if it's pouring rain like it was supposed to be today, uh, it's not going to hold your mushrooms. So uh, the other thing about a wicker basket is that it's permeable. And so if you're carrying mushrooms around in your basket, you're kind of like Johnny Mushroom Seed and spreading spores around as you walk through the woods. Uh, you need some sort of a cleaning device, a brush of some sort if you're going to collect animals. Uh, we use wax paper bags. I call it our field filing system. It's a way of organizing your, your collections. And I, I use the word collections because that's important. If you find the same mushroom, you want to pick different age groups. So young ones, medium-sized, medium-aged ones, and older ones, all 
give you different characteristics that you need to identify your mushroom. If you can only find one, that's what you're stuck with. But if you have a collection, put that collection of different mushrooms of different ages into your wax paper bag, roll the top down, put it in your basket. For smaller mushrooms, it also protects them from being crushed. The other thing that I find uh, nice about the wax paper bags is it's really important to start looking, you start your identification process in the field by looking at the habitat where you're finding your mushroom. Because different mushrooms grow with different trees. So depending on some lookalikes, they, depending on which tree you're growing with, gives you a different uh, characteristic for putting a proper identification on that mushroom. So if you're picking under oak, pick some oak leaves up and stick them in your bag. If you're under pine, put some pine needles in there to give you a reminder when you get home to actually start your identification process of where you found the mushroom. If it's growing on wood, it's really important to know what kind of wood it was growing on. So uh, if you can identify the wood, uh, it, take some notes along. You know, it's difficult when it's raining to take notes in the field. If it's like now, you can just go ahead and take a notebook, you know, write down, you know, what you're, you're finding, where you're finding them, the habitat you're finding them in, and, you know, put a little piece of paper in your wax bag, something of that nature. A knife is nice to have for, you know, either uh, cleaning the mushroom sometime, you can shave the, the bottom of a mushroom, let's say a big boat porcini. Uh, it's nice to do that in the field. I like to do as much field cleaning as I can for edibles. You can get the dirt off, leave it in the field, because if you've got a nice mushroom and you turn it upside down in your basket, and you've got a big lump of dirt on the bottom, all that dirt is going to go into the gills of the mushroom, and I don't like crunchy <laughs> mushrooms. It's just it's a big turn off. So, uh, something to dig with. That's going to be important for things like the genus Amanita, where you need to collect the entire mushroom. Because the features at the bottom of the stem are an important identification feature. So. You can use paper sacks for larger specimens. Uh, try not to use plastic. All right? uh, a plastic sack won't fall apart like a paper sack will. But wild mushrooms have a tendency to have more moisture content in. and. Collecting them in plastic, they soon start to disintegrate. Mm -hmm. So you'll, you'll remember, you go to the store, you buy the little white button mushrooms, use that plastic sack that's so convenient, and three days later in the refrigerator, they're brown and slimy, right? Take them out of the plastic, put them in a paper sack, they won't do that well. So, um, okay. So on these particular species, uh, it's important to look at the, the entire mushroom. You'll notice on this agaricus, the big bulbous base. That's an important feature. The amp, this is, everyone I think recognizes this mushroom. Probably the most photographed mushroom in the world. It grows worldwide, Amanita muscaria. Uh, and the feature at the bottom of the mushroom is very important for that particular species. This gomphidius, um, with, if you just cut it off here, you miss that bright yellow base at the stem. And that's an important feature to differentiate between different Gomphidius species. You need a good book. And in my opinion, this is the best field guide that we have for Central California and for you know, other areas as well. This was written, it's actually pretty dated now. The second edition, which I have here, is actually was, was produced in 1986. So a lot has happened since then, mostly name changes. The, there is a lot of studies going on that have shown that the names being used, predominantly in the older books, are not correct. Many of the names were borrowed from East Coast or European species. And we're finding with additional studies using microscopy 
and especially DNA. A lot of the mushrooms are being sequenced now, and they're finding the whole naming system is completely changing. We're in a, a huge flux right now on name changes. So, this is the important thing that you have to learn to make observations and deductions based on the characteristics of the mushroom. I really feel like identifying mushrooms is like emulating Sherlock Holmes. Look for the minutia and draw conclusions from those. And it's the collection of all the different characteristics. So if you're going to identify mushrooms, do not just look at a book, look at a picture and say, this is my mushroom, this is a picture, and they look alike. That is seriously dangerous. I have, I, I consult with the local hospitals uh, in the area, and most of the mushroom poison cases that I have dealt with, people have said, it looks like. You want to have at least five characteristics. Color, shape, spore color, habitat, um, how the decorations on the cap, is it smooth, is it sticky, does it have hairs on it, all of those things are features that you look for. And it's those combinations of features that you use to narrow down what the name of your mushroom is. Uh, one of the things I feel is really important is get into the field, collect things, but go with someone who knows what they're doing. So these happen to be uh, a couple of friends of mine from the Fungus Federation. Uh, and it really is important, even if you're actually at the point where you feel confident to start using the field guides and putting names on mushrooms, I would say the biggest problem most beginners have is misidentifying things. Go, coming to conclusions that are incorrect. So, it's really important, in my opinion, that if you're putting a, trying to put a name on something, that you get help. That someone that you trust will verify your identification. And so then you really know when you're getting home because if you start by eating amanitas, that you identify yourself. And your confidence is, is building. So amanitas are one of those Jekyll Hyde genera because they contain the world's deadliest mushrooms and some of the best of them. And unless you can differentiate two species, you shouldn't be eating them. Okay. <clears throat> okay, here's some uh, mushrooms that are common in this area. This is our old friend, the Porcini, uh, Boletus edulis, variety Grand edulis. Uh, these are common on the Monterey Peninsula under pine. They're, it's a pine associate, and so when I say that, what that is describing is a mushroom, it, it's a fungus whose mass, the mycelium, is growing in conjunction with a host tree, in this particular case, pine. And the mycelium will actually grow around the root tips, the, and that's called a mycorrhizal relationship. The mycorrhizal relationship, relationships are probably the most important of the different types of mushrooms, that different types of fungi, because that symbiotic relationship is actually beneficial to the trees, and the trees are beneficial to the fungus. So the fungus acts as a uh, very good collector of minerals and water, and they actually transport those basic nutrients to the tree across cell walls. And the tree, in turn, produces sugars, polysaccharides, that are given back to the fungus as food. You may know or may not know that mushrooms do not photosynthesize. All fungi must get their carbon from a separate source. So mycorrhizal is one relationship. Uh, parasitic, there are mushrooms that are parasitic, and parasites, are, as you know, the, the host is suffering from the relationship. And then there are, are what we call saprophytes. Saprophytic fungi basically grow anywhere and any, everywhere there are the proper conditions. 
they're breaking down organic material, and many of the mushrooms we see in the woods are of that nature. Uh, although, you know, like I say, some of these do have uh, associates. This, for instance, associates with pine. Chanterelles associate with oaks around here. This particular species, which is Cantharellus californicus, is associated with our coastal live oak. And up north, these associate with Douglas fir. But that's Cantharellus formosus, a different species. Candy caps, they have an aroma that when they're dry, they smell and taste like uh, maple syrup. And it's, it's an amazing mushroom. <clears throat> and this guy, this is the worst of the worst. This is the death cap, okay? Amanita phylloides. And in my opinion, this is the mushroom you learn first. Forget all those animals. <laughs> learn the one that's going to kill you. Okay, so. Uh, different, di mushrooms are very seasonal. So different things come up at different times. This is the, uh, the prince, Agaricus Augustus. That's this guy, the one that's on the, the cover of the book. It's a wonderful edible. It, the uh, aroma and the flavor of this mushroom is marzipan. It's a very strong almond flavor. Uh, oyster mushrooms, one of the first things that comes up, these will come up before you get any rain because they grow on, on dead oak around here. Um, our, our live oaks uh, support a bunch of these. Only on dead oak though. And the wood will start absorbing moisture as it cools off in the fall. And these will come up. These are also one of the easiest mushrooms to cultivate if you're into doing that. And so a lot of uh, the different commercial growers will grow this. They grow on sawdust, for instance. So they make sawdust bags and they'll grow. Um, <clears throat> other fall mushrooms, you can see how large the porcini get. So I personally have found a five pounder. One mushroom, five pounds. And apparently, uh, a six or seven pounder is not uncommon. These are probably only about uh, two or three, so you can imagine what a five pounder looks like. Uh, this one is called the delicious milk cap, Lactarius deliciosus, and this is one, this is a European species, deliciosus. This, the genus Lactarius, they're called the milk caps because when you break them, they exude a latex, a juice. I clicked the wrong button here, sorry. Oh, okay. I don't know how I got that up. Just go off, this, off the screen and click it. Escape. There we go. Good. Um, anyway, in Europe, it is delicious. The one we have, it turns out, four different species. That all, when you see this, somebody scored the, the gills, and it has a carrot orange latex. And they're not delicious. They're edible. They're not particularly good. Uh, and then this one is one of the prime edibles in the genus Amanita. This is the one. The Italians love this. They call it Cocora, whatever that means. Uh, okay. Let's spend a little time on this guy and how you uh, recognize this. This is an import. This is not a native species. Um, in the 40s, I think it was in this part of the world where they imported cork oak, thinking that maybe they could get the cork trees to produce a viable product like the European cork oak. It turns out that the cork didn't work, it still doesn't. Um, but they brought this guy in. And this is a mycorrhizal species on oak, and it lo absolutely loves our coastal live oak. So you'll notice the color. You've got some shade of yellow to green, this shiny appearance. It's got the, the, what you look for. The genus Amanita always has white gills that stay white. The spores are white. So if, if, the, if the spore is a different color, it will color the gills as the Mushroom ages. That's why I say you pick old ones because they show different features than young ones. This is a young one. You'll notice the, the skirt-like 
annulus, the ring on the stem, and a deep sac-like vulva. Okay? And what happens on the genus Amnita? When they're young, the mushroom is completely enveloped in what's called a universal veil. So the mushroom is, looks like an egg. As the stem elongates, it pushes up through that veil and oftentimes will leave material on the top of the cap and it will leave material at the bottom of the stem. So depending on whether or not, go back one. See the, this is the universal veil that's on this particular mushroom. That does not happen on Amanita phylloides. But see the deep sac like vulva and then this real felty uh, patch. It, but on some mushrooms, like if you remember the picture of the Amida muscaria, there's little white dots. So that's the universal veil that breaks up differently in different species. That's why all of those features are important. So this again is mycorrhizal with our coastal live oak. But we're actually finding now that it's spreading to other hosts. It's absolutely taking off and going everywhere. And uh, it turns out that there's not many mushrooms that will actually kill you. This happens to be one of them. Okay, so winter mushrooms. This is uh, the chanterelle. Normally, during this time of the year, we've, we've found spots where there, we find just hundreds of chanterelles in this, in this valley. Not this year. Uh, Matsutake. Matsutake in Japanese means pine mushroom. It's mycorrhizal with pine. So, and we find these here. This is the white gold. If you've read, seen articles about, you know, Matsutake pickers, the commercial pickers in Oregon, Washington. This is what their target is. These can reach $500 a pound in Japan. So it's this particular mushroom could be $50, you know, to a, to a picker, to a picker. And that's that's really unusual, and these can be thick. And then this is one of my personal favorites, the craterellus, craterellus cornucopioides, little cornucopia, because they are hollow. You see how they're tube-like, and they're hollow all the way down through. And this is just an absolutely wonderful mushroom. Spring mushrooms. This is probably one of the best mushrooms there is, by far. It's sweet, it's nutty, the flavor is absolutely wonderful. And they grow right next to the spring deadly poisonous mushrooms that we have that is a local species. And if this one is faded to white and the other one, which is a white mushroom, is slightly on the old side, they pick up the same similar colors. And so you really have to know your stuff in order to identify this mushroom. And this is the black morel, uh, which after a forest fire, you can find these things by the absolute bushel. You know, I've been in areas where they are thick. You can't walk for stepping on these things. And there's acres of them. So if you remember last spring, the rim fire, several hundred square miles, immediately mushroom hunters were saying, aha, but that first thing that happened was they closed off that area for, for hunting. So, okay. So one of the things you, you start doing is you're, you're sitting at home now, you're out of the field, and so some of these mushrooms will give you a staining reaction. It's an oxidation that when you bruise the mushroom, like this one, turns bright yellow, and this one turns blue. And um, there's the bolides. You see this is a bolide. You don't have gills, you have pores here. And you'll notice these are the tubes. So all of those are tubes inside of which the spores are produced. Okay, so you can taste mushrooms Taste and odor, for me, are something I use a lot because I'm red-green colorblind. 
And so colors are really critically important, and I can easily ask somebody who can see colors. But for me, I have a distinct sense of smell and taste. So, but, spit it out. You can, you can take a poisonous mushroom, chew it up, taste it, spit it out, and you'll be fine. With poisonous ones, I spit twice. So, uh, and then you do a spore print, okay? So, this is a good example of a mushroom that changes dramatically. This is an agaricus species. This is a mature one. You'll notice the color of the gills. So, the white button mushroom that you get at the store is, is, the same, is in the genus agaricus. But if you look at those gills, on a small one, especially one with a closed veil, you'll notice that the gills are pinkish. So those are the immature gills. And the spores, this is a spore print. You basically take the mushroom, cut the stem off, lay this on a piece of white paper, glass works, old CD cases, etc., etc. Something you can, you can see the color. This is the color that turns this, the pink gills, this chocolate brown. This is just a plug for the Fungus Federation. So um, the, the, the nice thing about being in a group is you have the local expertise. You know, you can go to somebody that uh, knows what they're doing. We, we have identification sessions. I teach an identification class you know, through the Fungus Federation. So if you're interested in doing that sort of thing, you know, there is a local resource. But we talk a little bit more about uh, different types of, of fungi. It, um, there is an estimate that I've heard, several estimates of the total number of, of fungal species <laughs> in the world. And it's, I've heard the low estimate is one and a half million. The high estimate is three and a half million. And so far, <coughs> they feel that there have been names put on about 100,000. So most fungal species apparently have not yet been discovered. Probably the most common question I am asked yeah. is, am I harmed by touching the mushroom? Yeah. No. You have to eat them. <clears throat> and you have to consume a certain quantity. Like all toxins, it's dose-related. So a larger dose makes you more sick, you know, so forth. It doesn't hurt to touch them. I, I consult with the local hospitals. Probably the most common call that I get is from panicked parents whose toddler, you know, has right. grazed. And most of the time, it's on grass. Fortunately, very, very few things grow on grass that are poisonous. Right. Unless there is a tree nearby and it's producing things that are in the grass because it's associated with the tree roots. It's just a grassland species out in the middle of nowhere, no trees around. It, you know, you probably have a 99 plus percent chance of not having any kind of an issue.